to day number two. I hope you all had a good night rest and uh, were able to enjoy some of Trieste and saw some things. But anyways, uh, today um, we're going to be all day. We're going to be up here. Uh, we're going to have lunch again outside um, the buffet like we did yesterday. So I think we now get in the, the role of things, how things work, right? So that's good. Um, so today uh, we're going to have Glenn and Beng uh, opening, so he's going to continue his discussion on um, adiabatic quantum computing. And then we're going to have uh, start with uh, error uh, mitigation in the morning. So we're going to have some Zoom uh, meetings. Unfortunately, the speakers couldn't come. And then in the afternoon, we're going to have error correction. So uh, it's going to be a very exciting pro program again today. You're going to learn a lot. Um, please uh, ask questions. If you have a question, we do have you're supposed to have a mic, oh, we have a microphone, so we're gonna try to use the microphone because people online can't hear you. But without any further ado, um, we're looking forward to part number two. Okay, thank you. Okay, so thank you very much for the introduction. And uh, today I'm gonna continue the discussion I started yesterday, and I'm gonna discuss about this adiabatic quantum computation. So the main thing that uh, I'm gonna maybe write here that we should uh, uh, remember is this will be the conclusion of, our, of uh, the last lesson. So we started saying at the end that if we have a classical uh, optimization problem, okay, Okay, so this is going to be the problem of uh, given a certain function, h, which goes from a set of classical bits to r, it's going to be finding the minimum. So, so zeta star, which is going to be uh, is going to be, let's say, arg mean, so it's going to be the minimum of h of zeta over all the bit strings. So here, zeta, as we said, are binary variables. Zeta 1 is a collection of n binary variables. Okay. So actually, let me just change notation compared to yesterday, and I'm going to use small n to indicate this. And this can assume, this zeta here can assume value 0 or 1. So as we say, there are some interesting problems that can be written like that. And uh, what we discuss is that this can be translated in a ground state Problem, okay, which is going to be finding uh, the ground state of the following Hamiltonian, which we called final, uh, H final, and it's going to be the sum over the Z over the strings of H. Okay, and uh, finding the ground state, so that we are going to say GL, the ground state, uh, is going to be equal to our uh, Z star that we are looking for. So it's equivalent to solve the ground state problem of this Hamiltonian or to solve the optimization problem. And to solve the ground state problem, we used adiabatic uh, 
quantum uh, computation. Okay, and uh, we said that we supplement the Hamiltonian which, with another Hamiltonian, HI, and uh, we start, the, we initialize the system in uh, psi zero uh, at time zero is going to be equal to the ground state of HI. So we are going to call it C0 where C0 is the ground state of HI. And uh, let me just continue here. Okay. And uh, if we uh, do that, we can evolve the system with the following Hamiltonian. Uh, let's say we can define this H, which is going to be uh, F times HF plus one uh, minus, uh, uh, yeah, one minus F times HI. Okay, okay, here maybe let's use a different notation because this, so this F here just represents the final, that is final, so I'm gonna maybe write it like this. Just to differentiate from this f, which is going to be a function of s, okay, and uh, we said that usually we will take it to be s equal to s. So, so the important thing is that f of zero should be equal to zero, and f of one should be equal to one. So, under the condition, the if I take start from the initial state, and uh, I evolve with uh, the Hamiltonian H of uh, uh, T over tot or over the total time, so we are using S equal to t over the total time. I'm going to end up after a time t in uh, a final state, which is going to be approximately uh, more or less proportional to the final ground state. OK, which here is Theta star. So, the ta so this for this to happen, so for the algorithm to solve uh, the the problem, what I need is that the evolution has to be slow enough, and uh, uh, because in this case the adiabatic theorem tells us gives us a run time, so tells us that if the time is. Uh, uh, the time, let's say, that I need is going to be less or equal of a constant divided by epsilon, which is the error that I, I expect I want to obtain. The, the so it would be related to the accuracy. And uh, here I'm going to have the <coughs> H of S, we say minus divided by the gap squared, and I'm going to have a maximum S in 0, 1. OK, so this is telling us that if we have uh, a problem and we find these Hamiltonians, we can compute then for the time that is going to require to solve this problem with this algorithm by using the adiabatic theorem. Okay, so the adiabatic theorem, I repeat it, I'll repeat it just quickly. What it says, it says that the system is gonna remain in the instantaneous ground state of the Hamiltonian as long as uh, we have this, let me just draw 
here we have that this gap it's going to be these are the energies these are going to this is going to be the time and we're going to have the energies as a function of time or the let's say uh, e zero state and for the e one and this gap it's the delta is this uh, delta of s is going to be the difference between these two energies. So E1 minus uh, minus E0 of s. Okay. So, so this is what we discussed. And uh, I want to show, I want to discuss today uh, an application of this, uh, of this uh, algorithm. And I'm going to discuss the simplest application, and that is going to be uh, applying it to the Grover problem. So, so we are going to look at the problem of uh, search in an unstructured on, on search. So. So we are given a database which uh, contains, uh, in this case, n, which is going to be 2 to the n elements, which are uh, bit strings uh, of, uh, uh, you can write them as bit strings of n bits. OK. And uh, we are given a marked. Uh, state, in this case, uh, we're going to call it uh, uh, zeta star again. We are given a mark state. And uh, we have uh, uh, a function such that if we call it on Q of Z, it's going to give one if z is the mark state and zero otherwise. Okay, so, so, okay, so this is uh, the function that tells us which is uh, the the string we, uh, we are looking for, and, we, and in the Grover problem, it's an oracle problem, so the, so the problem involves uh, the number of queries of times I have to call this function in order to, so, in, to find the item. So we know that uh, uh, classically, so, we have uh, that uh, the number of queries is going to be uh, of the order of uh, n or 2 to the n. So, OK. So 2 to the small n in this case. And uh, we know that, uh, on the other hand, uh, you have seen that uh, uh, in the gate base, let's say gate based quantum computing, you can make instead, you can use the Grover algorithm, which is going to achieve uh, the same results. So it's going to solve the problem. However, it's going to do it uh, in a time which is uh, scales at. Uh, uh, square root of n, and these are like actually this is this is the best you can do, right? So the best you can do, classically, it's uh, uh, scales at n, and so you get uh, a quadratic uh, speed up in the algorithm if you go to uh, the gate-based quantum computing. And now I want to look at the same problem uh, and uh, tackle it with uh, uh, this uh, adiabatic. Uh, 
quantum optimization algorithm that I've described till now. So, in, so the first thing that we have to do uh, to tackle the problem is to, ch to transform the problem into a minimization problem. Okay, so we have to we have to find an H of Z that we want to minimize in the Grover. And uh, the H of Z that we want to minimize is, is quite easy to get. So we see that we want that the mark item, so we're gonna take uh, Q of Z minus Q of Z, and in this case, we're gonna have a minus uh, one, if uh, z equal to z star and is zero otherwise. And uh, a noun z star is exactly the minimum of h of z. The, the, the minimum, because it's the only point where the uh, value is minus one and we have zero for all of the other ones. Okay, so now that we are into this kind of problem, into an optimization problem, uh, we can uh, use the, uh, we can start the uh, program to use the uh, adiabatic algorithm. Uh, and uh, to do this, we say the first thing is to write the final Hamiltonian, so the target Hamiltonian, uh, which we want to, that, uh, from, which, from which we need the ground state, and this Hamiltonian is going to be, uh, in this case, uh, as we said, I'll write the formula again. Okay. Okay, and in this case, since we have a zero for all non-marked uh, items, this is going to be simply minus Z star. Okay, and uh, the second thing, okay, so we want to find the ground set of this uh, uh, Hamiltonian, uh, which uh, by the way, it's uh, a bit, uh, it's written as a projector, but you may want to see it as uh, in terms of uh, spin, Pauli spin operators on each side. So this can also be done. And uh, if you want to write it like that, you're going to get that the Hamiltonian is going to be a product uh, for J that goes from one to N of one plus Z star of J sigma Z J divided by two. Okay, and uh, this I'm not uh, gonna discuss it. It's just, this is just simply the projector, a projection operation on uh, each uh, individual, uh, uh, for each individual uh, uh, qubit is projecting on the right value of, of uh, that the qubit you have according to Z star, and by doing this for all qubits, uh, we can obtain the Hamiltonian. So it's like actually a, a quite a complicated Hamiltonian if you write this product explicitly and would contain uh, pro, uh, products of uh, uh, this uh, sigma z variable, uh, which uh, can be up to the the whole system can co can contain the whole system. The second thing we need is uh, an initial uh, Hamiltonian. So we said that the initial Hamiltonian should be chosen uh, like uh, uh, should be cho should be chosen. Uh, it uh, can be chosen by us. So once we have the final Hamiltonian, the, we have to make a choice and choose an appropriate initial Hamiltonian. So in this case, the final Hamiltonian is uh, it's, uh, what is for us is going to be the oracle. So it's playing the role of this QZ here. 
in the classical algorithm because this final Hamiltonian contains uh, its uh, information about uh, the state we, w we want to, that is marked, and uh, we uh, want to use it uh, within the evolution to find the marked state. So in this case, calling uh, the, the oracle becomes using this Hamiltonian. And uh, consequently, the initial Hamiltonian, which is uh, part of our algorithm instead, cannot use the mark state because we should find the mark state without uh, making use of the fact that we know what it is. So it cannot contain Z star. And uh, uh, the choice for the initial Hamiltonian is going to be simply minus, again, a projector on C0, where uh, uh, C0, in this case, is, uh, since the Hamiltonian is written like this, C0 is, is uh, the ground state of the, by the, uh, is the ground state of the Hamiltonian, and we choose C0 to be the normalized, uh, so the normalized uh, uh, sum over uh, uh, all states. So this is the equal superposition. So we're starting from, from the equal superposition of, uh, of, compu of the computational basis. And uh, so, sorry, let me add the cat. And, uh, the re and this, of course, don does not assume that we know which, uh, what is the marked state, because this state is totally independent, because we are taking all state with the same weights. And uh, the, this state, it's uh, actually not so hard to prepare, because uh, it can be written as, uh, uh, let's say, as uh, the product. So it's going to be, let's say, the tensor product of uh, zero, one divided by square root, so, and this on the j, on the j spin. So it's going to be like, uh, yeah, that's right, just. So it's going to be like uh, a, a, a state which is uh, defined uh, on uh, a single QB, or on, uh, it's a product state. So these product states are usually quite easy to prepare. And uh, the, the initial Hamiltonian can also similarly be written as uh, in terms of the uh, Pauli uh, operators. And uh, uh, in this case, sigma x. And you get a similar, similar expression to the previous one, but with, sigma, uh, with the sigma x. I will not, uh, I will not write it now, uh, because uh, in the following, we are going to mainly use this expressions in terms of project, so projection operator. So after this, the evolution, uh, the Hamiltonian is going to be, of the system is going to be controlled by the, by the, by the, the evolution of the system is going to be controlled by this, this Hamiltonian, which is going to be given by uh, substituting in that formula, these expressions, and we are going to have uh, F times Z star minus, and we're going to have one minus F times Z zero. Okay, so if we evolve the system with uh, this Hamiltonian. Again, F is, uh, uh, should have those properties that we described before. And uh, one mm, easy choice, as we said, is going to be F of S equal S. If we use the evolution uh, that uh, I described before, we can solve the problem with the adiabatic uh, uh, optimization algorithm. But in, and in this case, the issue is uh, what is the time that's uh, required to solve the problem? Do I need a time that scales 
wars or co comparable to this classical time that is needed, or can I do something with this algorithm as good as I was getting in the gate-based quantum computing uh, model? And uh, to do so, we have to uh, use the formula of the time, and uh, you would see that uh, the formula for the time uh, which is uh, gonna is involving the derivative uh, let's say h dot of s and it's involving the gap delta of s so the next step is going to be computing these objects in order to in order to evaluate what is the time needed. And let me just Okay, so from here we are just gonna keep until here and just keep the results that we need on the blackboard. And the first result is that uh, HF was minus this star action and that HI was minus C0. Okay. And uh, now, as we said, we have to evaluate, uh, and we had that, sorry, maybe let me write also the, the, the interpolation, which is going to be minus uh, F uh, Z star Z star. Minus 1 minus F. C0, C0. So this is what we discussed previously. And now we just have to evaluate the terms that appear in the in the in the in the, in the expression for the time. So the if we compute the first term, which is going to be the norm of of age, uh, we had mentioned yesterday that. Uh, you can take various norms here, but here I would consider the two norm, so which is going to be equal to, so the two norm square is going to be equal to the trace of h of square, h dot squared. Okay, and uh, we are going to have that uh, for uh, uh, this, uh, in this case, we're going to get the trace of f dot. This is going to be equal to the trace of s f dot. Z star uh, z. Uh, let's say minus c0, c0. Okay, so never the uh, moreover, we will assume that okay we will i mean we we will assume that f dot is positive, so we we can take it out from okay, and we are gonna use just this uh, simple relation which says that uh, uh the trace. Uh, of uh, x, y, k okay, is equal to, uh, this is going to be equal to y, x. Okay, so we are going to use this and uh, we, we can compute the trace. 
And uh, let me just give you directly the result. So you're going to have that, uh, the trace, sorry, the, 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 the square. Uh, let me write here just explicitly. I mean, that's correct, but let's use the trace form directly here so we can go to the next step. And uh, in this case, we are going to have 1 minus uh, 1 over n, where we use that uh, the overlap between C0 and uh, G star is equal to 1 over square root of n. OK. OK, fine. And uh, this is the first term that we need. So similarly, we can, uh, for this problem, we can compute uh, uh, also the second term that we need, which is going to be the gap. So the gap, the computation of the gap, it's uh, a bit more uh, involved. So I will just, uh, in this case, uh, describe uh, uh, quickly maybe a method to get, to get it, but I'm not going to uh, write it explicitly. So uh, why can we get in this uh, problem, which is uh, a many body problem? So how is it possible that we can compute this object? When to do it, we need to diagonalize the problem, and we have uh, uh, usually a, a hard time diagonalizing uh, many body Hamiltonian. So the reason is that the Hamiltonian all involves uh, the projection, or projection over two states. So it can be written in the basis with uh, we can use the basis, the the, the basis, uh, a basis containing g star and uh, it's uh, orthogonal which is uh, going to be um, which is simply going to be g star minus the uh, minus 1 over square root of n times uh, uh, P0 divided by, uh, divided by 1 over, over uh, divided by the, by the norm. So, I mean, I will not normalize it, actually, that's not quite important for, for this one. It's actually going to be like this. So the Z star is proportional to this. And the reason is that this is the projection uh, of C0 on Z star. And we can remove, uh, we can remove the projection from uh, Z star. And if we do this, we have just uh, a basis with two elements, because all the other uh, elements in the basis, uh, we, could, we can leave them the same, and they don't contribute to the problem. And, uh, we get a two by two Hamiltonian, a two by two Hamiltonian. And for this uh, Hamiltonian, which is uh, simply uh, a two by two Hamiltonian, we can uh, find uh, the uh, gap. So I'm gonna write the expression of the gap uh, after this. So let me copy it directly from the notes. OK, so the expression of the gap. is going to be. Delta mean square. One plus. Okay, so this is the expression we get 
you will get if you do this uh, computation of diagonalizing the two by two, the, the two times two Hamil uh, uh, Hamiltonian, and uh, computing the gain values and taking the difference. Uh, yes. So actually, this I've written it for the gap squared. If you take the square root of that, you're going to get the gap. But uh, let's just keep it with the gap squared because that's actually what uh, appears in the Hamiltonian. So I have to tell you, you what are uh, these terms that I've introduced. So we have that uh, delta mean. Uh, let me just uh, go here a second. We're going to have that delta mean and uh, uh, V are going to be respectively equal to the square root of minus N and 1 over Square root of n. Okay. And now we can use uh, these expressions to evaluate uh, the the time. So as we said, the time is gonna be the ratio between the uh, is gonna be the ratio between proportional. So to the ratio between h dot, uh, and we have to take the maximum over s of the ratio between h dot and delta squared. And uh, if we take this, in this case, we, we get uh, an expression which is, uh, um, let's uh, write it. So one minus one over n. So this is uh, the one for uh, uh, a, the h dot term, and we're going to have divided by uh, divided by delta min. And uh, we are going to have a delta of s divided by delta min. OK. So uh, OK, so wh what is, uh, let me put the squares because it's squared. OK, so if I take uh, this expression and uh, I try to, I, I can rewrite it, I can separate uh, delta, mean square, uh, delta mean squared from it. So this is going to be squared, and we're going to have, uh, let's say, sorry. 1 over delta mean squared. And we're going to have here a delta mean over ds. And we are going to have here the f dot times square one of n. OK, so how do we see how this uh, what's the scaling of uh, this uh, object when we take the maximum, right? Because there was a maximum here over S, and we have a maximum over S. So how do we see how, what's the scaling of this object? So I call this delta mean because actually, as you can see from the function of the gap, this is the minimum. So if I plot the gap as a function of S, We are going to have that uh, 
Uh, okay, here we're gonna have that the gap is like this, and S goes from one, two, and at S one half. you're gonna have a minimal gap here, okay? And the value of the minimal gap is, uh, you substitute as one, one half here, you get exactly, that is delta mean. And uh, the, the, okay, so, so that's the first thing. Then the second thing, it's uh, what is uh, this uh, F dot, okay? And uh, this F dot, we say that, uh, Usually, we can choose f equal f of s equal s, and in this case, we are going to have f dot equal 1. So this will directly imply that when taking uh, uh, the maximum, we can uh, have that uh, we can replace, uh, we said we can replace, we are gonna this with uh, okay, times n, and we are gonna have a maximum over s of the ratio of delta mean over delta of s squared. Okay, and uh, this expression, it's uh, always uh, smaller than one because delta mean is the minimum gap. Okay, here I substituted the expression of delta mean, and uh, what I get is that the, the time that I need, it's uh, going to be uh, under the assumption that I'm taking this uh, linear schedule, is gonna be proportional to n. And then we have a term which is square root of uh, uh, one, uh, 1 minus 1 over n, which is more or less proportional to n in, uh, in the limit of large n. So we get that uh, this uh, unsatisfying result that, uh, the, that, the, that using this linear schedule in the Grover problem, we would have a result similar to the classical one. We have that the time needed, so the time for which I need to use my uh, oracle, uh, HF, it uh, uh, scales as, as n, as the number of items in the, in the, in the problem. So how do we correct, uh, can we correct this? And uh, the issue is that uh, this is uh, closely related to our choice of the schedule. And uh, the, the idea is that we can find uh, a better schedule which does, um, uh, which does uh, uh, a better job. So we have to choose an F of S. We want to look for an F of S which when uh, substituted here, I can take the maximum, and uh, the maximum it's going to be uh, the maximum that I obtain is going to be it's going to be uh, it's going to be better. So I'm going to have like uh, some total time which scales uh, uh, better than n. And in this case, one, uh, the way to do it was uh, proposed uh, in 2002 by Roland Serf, and they suggested that. Uh, uh, we should try to keep this object, we want to maximize a constant uh, during the whole evolution. So what is this object saying? As we already described yesterday, this uh, object that we're trying to maximize is telling us that when, uh, when the gap uh, is uh, small, uh, the, the, this uh, object is uh, growing, and so if I want the total time to be somehow reasonable and not too big, I have to slow down. So H dot has to be, 
uh, has to be smaller. So each dot has to, so I have to slow down the evolution when I see a, a closing gap. However, in the linear schedule, this is not done. So since in this case, I know the gap, I can look for an f of s in such a way that uh, this, uh, this object is constant. So the error that I'm making, so let's say this uh, error that I'm making depending on s, it's uh, s independent. And then when I will take the maximum, so if I have a function which I can keep constant equal to c to const, Uh, is going to be equal to, to this. So f dot, uh, we say it n 1 minus over n square root, and we're going to have delta mean squared over delta s squared. Okay, so this is uh, a differential equation for uh, my function f. Okay, and uh, let me uh, just, men uh, just mention that this differential equation for this particular uh, uh, problem can be solved exactly, and uh, I'll just write uh, the solution of the differential equation directly. So, so if you solve the differential equation that is below, you are going to get such a solution. So. Uh, excuse me. Yeah. You are going to get uh, uh, f of s is going to be one half two S one. Okay. So this is the solution, and uh, where the, the objects that I've introduced are are tangent of square root of n minus one. Okay, and. Uh, Okay, w once you have uh, this, you can uh, insert uh, uh, f dot uh, in the expression for the, for, the, for the time, and you would get that the total time uh, has to, would be more or less less or equal, and you're going to get a square root of n. And, uh, okay, so you're going to get some arcotangent. So, and this is proportional. Of course, you also have still this 1 minus epsilon, which is related to the error. And uh, the, okay, so if you, if you, and if you, after the substitution, you get that, Instead of having a scaling with n, you get a scaling with square root of n for the total time. So let me just 
to give you an idea, I'm going to draw the kind of schedule that you get. Let me try to make it as accurate as possible. <laughs> OK. OK. And uh, OK. OK. Sorry, this is F. And this is S. OK. So this is the kind of scale that you get. And indeed, it's slowing down at one half, where it's, which is where we know that uh, the gap is closing. So by taking a schedule which does this and uh, computing it uh, uh, properly, we get a total time which scales, which in the end is scaling, is, let's say, has the scale order of magnitude of square root of n. So in this case, by doing this, uh, by doing this we, we can recover the, uh, the speed up uh, that was uh, obtained with the gaze-based quantum computing. And we can do this in this, uh, uh, with uh, the, instead with the adiabatic quantum computing algorithm. So, so what is maybe the lesson from the, this problem? So first of all, it's, uh, we can recover the speed up uh, obtained with the usual quantum computing model using this other adiabatic quantum co computation. We, and uh, this is actually um, uh, a result which is quite general. So in general, we know that uh, uh, there, there is a theorem uh, that states that the two models of computation are equivalent. Uh, I didn't write them down, okay. But the two models of computation are equivalent. So I can equivalently use gate-based uh, computation and I can equivalently use adiabatic quantum computation and I'm going to uh, obtain at the end uh, the, the same scaling if I do it properly. If I use both of them uh, at the best, uh, at their best uh, performance. So uh, I don't have to do, for example, uh, choose wrong Hamiltonians or choose not the schedule, not in a smart way, because uh, this is going to make the, the, the problem, the, the algorithm underperform. So, so intrinsically, since they are the same, why should I prefer one or the other one? So first, first thing is that, let's say, let me add here, adiabatic. OK, so let, so let me uh, describe the differences. So the difference is that. While this one is obtained with using gates on a digital device, this one is obtained using an analog evolution on an on a, on analog, analog device, but from how I've uh, introduced it. And uh, so this can run quite uh, easily on analog devices. So this would be the first uh, advantage. The, the second advantage is that uh, uh, since this computation, as we described from the adiabatic theorem, occurs uh, only within the ground state. So the system is somehow, by the adiabatic theorem, forced to stay in the ground state. Uh, we would expect that uh, this is somehow, uh, as long as the temperature is low enough, somehow it uh, would have some intrinsic uh, noise re resilience to, uh, to, to, let's say, to thermal, to thermal noise. And uh, the... Uh, so, so this may have this kind of advantage. And uh, the, sec the other thing that I want to mention are maybe some difficulties that you would encounter when using this kind of, um, this kind of problem. So we saw before that uh, this HF was uh, actually, that is written here, it's actually uh, quite uh, a complicated object in the Grover problem. So in the, and uh, implementing this, you must have uh, a device where the Hamiltonian, so the interaction in the device, are such a way that uh, the Hamiltonian uh, H of S is this one. And in this case, I would just uh, remind you briefly that 
h of f was minus the product uh, over j of n of 1 plus z star j, z, j, j, z. Okay. Okay. And uh, <laughs> no, so this, if you expand it, would contain uh, all kind of terms that you can imagine, and there is, there is basically no device that can implement such an Hamiltonian. So you would also have to uh, redefine the problem in such a way that you can change the h of f such that this h of f can fit into your, uh, into, onto your device. So this is uh, actually also uh, one of the problems that arise in this kind of approach is that you can, uh, you, it's hard to expect that you can uh, do all computation with a single device without, uh, uh, let's say, large overhead due to trying to make this, uh, uh, implement these uh, complicated Hamiltonians on your quantum device. So uh, I'll not discuss how this is done, but there are techniques to, to do this, uh, which uh, are, uh, uh, go under the name of uh, embedding, and you can uh, implement this uh, kind of uh, complicated Hamiltonians, but this, uh, the, the price that you have to pay is that you have to increase the number of qubit. So it actually requires uh, uh, a lot of qubits to solve the problem. So uh, for the Grover, will not require just n qubits, but many more if we want to implement this complicated Hamiltonian on a quantum device. So this is the, the issue that uh, you would encounter. And uh, the uh, last thing that I want to mention is that this time that we get here, as we said, is related to the gap. And the fact that the gap was uh, becoming smaller uh, and smaller, it's not written here, so, but the gap, the minimum gap at least was scaling, uh, minimum gap square was uh, going as 1 over n, uh, and uh, uh, so it's closing uh, exponentially. It's becoming exponentially small in the size of the system, because the size of the system is 2 to the small n. Uh, it, they, they know the n is 2 to the size of the system. And uh, this feature, which is what makes the computation slow, so what makes this to appear, uh, it's quite a natural feature of many, uh, of many quantum systems. So in many quantum systems uh, that, arrive, that uh, describe problem Hamiltonians, you're going to have these closing gaps, and you're going to have to uh, use uh, similar techniques to try to slow down at the closing gap if you want to obtain some, let's say, uh, if you want to obtain some uh, uh, speed up using the best possible schedule. And this is also something which is not usually so easy to do because it's uh, um, uh, Computing this difference, it's hard for the many body case. As we said, we had an advantage because the Grover problem is very easy and we were able to compute this and do everything exactly. So usually you will not know what is the runtime of the algorithm because to know this, you need to compute the gap and you don't know the gap. So in most problems, you'll not know what the runtime of the algorithm is uh, and what you do it uh, usually goes under the name of quantum annealing. In these cases, you, you have no, you, you know that eventually you get a convergence if you go to a very long time, but you stop somewhere. You cannot stop when uh, using the adiabatic theorem uh, that tells you when to stop because the gap is unknown. So you just stop somewhere and you get uh, uh, some values and you read those as an approximate solution of your problem. And this is an heuristic algorithm which is actually used and uh, it's implemented in, uh, current, uh, device, in current devices, and there are com companies which commercialize these quantum annealers, uh, usually that are mainly based on superconducting qubits, but there are now also some version on Rydberg, uh, annealing with Rydberg atoms, and uh, this, uh, are, uh, this is another way to try to solve uh, these uh, optimization problems. And uh, it's, uh, at the moment, there is quite some research going on in trying to see whether 
uh, we can find a problem where this performs well. Because since we don't know the runtime, we, because we don't know the gap, we simply have to, uh, in this case, try it on a certain problem and see how it's performing. And various uh, companies and research groups are trying to find problems where this algorithm uh, can perform well. Okay, so that will be all. Thank you very much. Uh, yeah. So if there are any questions, uh, yes? Uh, I, I have a question. Okay. So uh, what kind of devices would you implement it today? Because you said it's not gate-based, what you were talking about. So which devices are you using to implement uh, this algorithm? Yeah, so it's not gate-based. I said, uh, like, uh, you can use uh, uh, superconducting qubits or... Uh, Atoms. I mean, in many cases, actually, in the gate-based device, what they do is that to realize the gates, they use uh, some uh, pulses or some uh, analog control that they use to realize the gate. So what we do is, what you can do in this kind of uh, devices is to go one step back and use, try to use directly the analog knobs and controls you have in your device. So it would work for most of the devices that are around. The, the, the main problem is that you're not going to have control over all of the terms that, are, that you're required uh, to control to implement the, the driving Hamiltonian written there. So you need uh, some device which is sufficiently flexible uh, such that we can implement this driving Hamiltonian, uh, complicated driving Hamiltonians, and is uh, sufficiently, uh, has sufficiently long coherence time so that you can uh, get to the run, uh, you can, the run time is gonna be, of the algorithm is gonna be smaller than the coherence time. And uh, at the moment, uh, uh, main, mostly, uh, the experiments of annealing on large systems are uh, done mainly with uh, Rigberg and uh, with uh, superconducting qubits. Hey, thank you very much. Um, in case there are no more questions, let's thank our speaker again. Thank you. Uh, and then we're going to